we are looking at a subject more from the point of view of how problems in general, problems that arise in life in general can be looked at, can be analyzed, can be broken down into its comp their component parts and then analyzed in a, in a manner that finally builds up to a solution, right. So, um, and this is the second course in reaction engineering. So, what we will do today essentially is we will go through the course outline uh, which is there on Moodle, but uh, uh, I will be using mostly the MS Teams interface which you may be familiar with, right. And I like that from the point of view of you know submissions and all that which you can do on Moodle also, but I am more familiar with that. And MS Teams I also use for a thing that I will I will talk about now. So let us go through this, there is, there is some basic information here. I think most of you will be either aiming towards a, a, an honours or uh, would be in the dual degree. There may be some others who will take this as an elective, but I am not sure. Prerequisite is CL324, credit structure is given. So that two, one, one is the tutorial, but we will not be having tutorials on a, on a week to week basis. So on a need basis, we will have tutorials. So it may happen once every two weeks or once every three weeks or whatever, right. Uh, if you feel the need for a tutorial, you can ask me for it on, on any particular topic uh, and then we will, we will have it. But otherwise, I will decide based on the complexity of the material and uh, the problem set that is being circulated as to whether we need uh, a tutorial session for it. My room is uh, CL224, you might know that from your lab days, uh, but uh, so I will be available generally on Tuesdays 3.30 to 5 p.m. for any doubts that you may have or for any other consultations. And uh, there is this uh, TA, his email address is given here. and. Um, he was just here a moment ago and then he said that he has a course uh, in the same slot. So he will not be able to attend this uh, uh, course, but uh, you know he will be participating in the correction of quizzes and stuff like that. And he is also a person who has done this course in the previous uh, edition and therefore uh, you know you can approach him for any doubts and so on, right. So you know him from your senior batch? No, okay. Might, might be good to get to know him. Right. So, by way of introduction, the second course in reaction engineering and therefore you are expected to not to have forgotten the material that you have uh, studied in CL324 and apart from reaction engineering, we will also need familiarity with uh, some allied subjects like transport phenomena, thermodynamics, mass transfer, etc. on the chemical engineering curriculum side and on the math side we will have good amount of use for linear algebra, differential equations, transform calculus, etc. right. So some of these you might have used for example in uh, the RTD theory you would have used Laplace transforms and so on right. I do not know if you did but uh, the, uh, so, so these uh, math uh, uh, background will also be assumed. So we treat uh, uh, advanced topics naturally because this is a second course and uh, of the topics that we we cover in this course are largely analytical that is what I was emphasizing at the beginning that you know it is about problem solving okay it is about not just in chemical engineering but generally in life as to how when uh, when uh, uh, faced with a complex problem how to deconstruct it how to uh, break it down into its component parts in a manner that each component part is easily comprehensible and then easily uh, understood and solved and then build up everything, assemble everything into a total solution to the original problem. So that is the kind of approach that we will take and the uh, underlying theme in the course is complexity, right. What do we mean by complexity? Something that is not simple and this complexity in reaction engineering can arise due to a number of reasons. One is that the reaction kinetics can be complicated, the rate expression may be, you know, you have seen langmuir hinshelwood type of rate expressions with a numerator and a denominator, non-linearities in rate expressions and so on. So or the reaction network itself might be complex, it might have a topology that is 
that makes it difficult to co comprehend and understand. Okay, there are species which are entering some reactions as reactant, some reactions as uh, uh, coming out of some reactions as products and so on. So these reaction networks uh, uh, might contribute to complexity, and uh, there could be feedback which uh, contributes to multiplicity of steady states and uh, stability issues and so on. Have you been exposed to some of these themes? Nonlinear dynamics, multiple steady states, no? Okay, so then we will spend some time on that. Um, so basically what happens is that, you know, especially to take exothermic reactions as an example, the reaction produces heat and that heat feeds back, it heats up the reaction contents and it makes the reaction go faster, all right. So there is this kind of a feedback and uh, under some circumstances this can result in uh, the reactor operating in uh, or uh, having available to it more than one steady state. So you design a reactor to give a conversion of let us say 75 percent or whatever and then when you actually run it you will get 5 percent conversion, right. So they are like a CSTR which in steady state performance is supposed to give you a constant conversion day in and day out, right. So that is because you know without your knowledge while you were designing it for a 75 percent uh, conversion there was lurking in the corner another steady state which was a 5 percent conversion steady state. And depending on how you start if the reactor finds itself close to the 5 percent it just sits down there, there is no incentive to move to the 75 percent uh, conversion steady state, okay. So there are issues like this which one should be aware of which arise from the nonlinearity and the and the thermal feedback effects. Feedback effects can also arise from concentration effect, concentration nonlinearities, not just the uh, temperature nonlinearity. Temperature nonlinearity is of course fact of life because of the Arrhenius equation, okay. That is a very nonlinear uh, behavior uh, which all reactions follow with respect to their how they depend on temperature, right. Uh, but you can have concentration nonlinearities and it has been shown in uh, uh, several papers that the nonlinearity has to be of a certain kind for it to cause these kinds of, you know, weird kinds of behavior, right. So that is the, um, these are some of the causes for complexities to arise and also complexities can arise because of non-ideal uh, flow patterns. So it can arise due to non-ideal flow patterns, you know, again you have been, you have had some introduction to the theory of residence time distributions and so on um, or it can be due to the presence of transport resistances, okay. Have you done, you have been introduced to heterogeneous reactions, right, right, you have uh, seen, thela, seen uh, thela modulus, effectiveness factor relationships and so on, right. So you know that the reaction might have an intrinsic kind of uh, rate but it is not able to uh, occur at that rate because it does not, all parts of the catalyst pellet will not be able to access reactant at the same concentration because of diffusion limitations, right. So this is one uh, aspect that is diffusion uh, limitations limit the access of reactants to the places where they are needed. Uh, there can also be uh, uh, heat transport limitations because of which if it is an exothermic reaction the center of the pellet will uh, uh, operate at one temperature the or different parts of the pellet in general will operate at different temperatures and therefore you get a rate behavior that is quite difficult to uh, analyze if you are only exposed to homogeneous kind of systems, right. So these can cause complexities. So all these make uh, reactions a, a, a little bit of a complex subject to understand in its various manifestations, right. So again given this kind of a complexity, how to decode this complexity, how to deconstruct it, how to uh, uh, decompose it into simpler, uh, simpler uh, uh, component parts and then therefore come up with a solution is one of the things that we will uh, look at. I mean you have already seen some of this, for example in uh, uh, diffusion reaction in spherical pellets which is a topic you might have seen. So there is a method of accounting for you know reaction and uh, diffusion occurring simultaneously and when you do that, when you solve the differential equations and when you get the uh, expressions, it collapses into a very neat uh, result which is the effectiveness factor versus theorem modulus plot, right. So things of that kind we will be looking at. Now how the course will run, 
problem solving is an essential part of the course because analytical reasoning is what will be emphasized um, and conceptual understanding of the material cover uh, you know we will we will use various ways in order to improve this conceptual understanding and some of these are there's a non exhaustive list but some of these we will be following in regard to class participation uh, i mean that that is the purpose of having it in a room like this so that there is more interaction right so i will encourage questions and if you don't ask questions i will right so that is the second part in under class participation so there will be pop up questions so this one and a half hour lecture can be a little boring so every 15 or 20 minutes depending on the lecture material we will try to break up and then uh, introduce a question so this will be flashed on the screen the question will be flashed on the screen and uh, you can answer on your laptops or mobile phones or whatever okay on teams on the teams platform so typically these uh, questions will be uh, of multiple choice but in some cases you might have to do some small calculation and fill in a blank or something like that right and typically these are short questions one to two minutes will be needed per per question so we will break up the uh, uh, the monotonicity of the lecture by introducing these kinds of uh, uh, questions in between and they will carry some weightage which we will come to but basically it is more than the weightage it is to you know keep you awake and uh, keep you engaged in the in what is going on in the class right then there will be surprise quizzes and uh, so these again will be in fact we will have one now so <laughs> so um, the idea of the surprise quizzes is uh, to you know again to keep you up to date on the uh, lecture material these will typically not require uh, hours of preparation or anything if you have been attentive in the class if you have been following keeping up with what is going on in the class you can come and write this quiz without any preparation okay so that is how they will be set they will be typically of 20 to 30 minutes um, and then there will be tutorials and uh, these tutorials will be based on problem sets okay so uh, typically so let's look at this first so i will be putting up uh, these problem sets on the moodle interface as well as on ms teams uh, and typically one week before when the problem sets will be uh, uh, worked upon right so you will have some time to look at the problems and so on come prepare to the class and if there is a tutorial session based on the problem set in that tutorial session we will solve some of the problems the problem sets will typically contain six or eight problems we will not be able to cover everything in the tutorial session but we will select some problems which you will solve in the class of course i will be there and uh, uh, of course if the ta is available he will also be there but probably not uh, given that he has a class also in this slot uh, so we will solve the problems together and you will submit the work that is done in the tutorial hour at the end of the tutorial hour okay uh, and whatever is in the problem set whatever is not covered in the tutorial class or whatever is partially covered in the tutorial class will be a part of the assignment right and typically you will have about a week to uh, work on the assignment and submit right um, so tutorials will be uh, sessions in which you will solve the pre-circulated problems in the class and submit the work done and problem sets will be you know there will be about I would expect about eight to nine problem sets through the uh, course uh, so that will be a fairly regular event and as I said you know a part of the set will be solved in the tutorial session and the remaining will be solved in assignments but it is also possible that uh, certain problem sets will be entirely assignments because we may not have a if it if the material is simple enough unless you request a tutorial then we may not have a tutorial also that is possible right and then in addition to all this we will have a course project okay and this course project uh, i've already collected some papers from the recent literature usually but there may be some from the older literature as well and each of you will be assigned one paper and your task will there will be further instructions on how to go about this course project and all that so uh, you will be uh, required to uh, read the paper understand it you might need to do some background work to uh, understand the material in the paper 
you might want to or you might have to read up some earlier literature as well. So that is all part of it. So the, although one paper is the centerpiece, in order to understand that you may need to go through some other papers as well, right? other literature as well. Uh, some of these papers will, will extend the concepts that we will cover in the uh, class and that is in fact the objective of this course project that you know you are enabled to look at the current literature although you may not be familiar with everything that is said in the paper you have the basic uh, capability which allows you to read up and then understand what is there in this in this uh, particular paper right these are some of the aspects which will help you understand the material a little better and uh, as far as instruction is concerned I will, be, I will be putting up uh, lecture notes on the course interface and this I will usually do on uh, MS Teams and usually in advance of the lecture you will have the material available and it will be nice if you can read up the material and come to the class so that we can have a more meaningful interaction on the topics and so I would like to make the lectures therefore a mix of my explanation, my lecturing, a mix of clearing doubts that you may have by virtue of having read the uh, lecture material earlier and so on uh, and then we will have some discussion and clearing of doubts and so on all right okay so this is the statutory warning academic mis misconduct is injurious to health so um, so i i expect that you know none of you will indulge in things that i will have to uh, take nasty steps about um, and then there is the course outline. So we'll start with a bit of a review, right? You have done isothermal reactions, where you know interpretation of rate data, batch kinetics, and the general mole balance equation, how it applies to batch reactors, uh, CSTRs, plug flow reactors. So all of this you have uh, you have already a background on. So we'll start with that briefly and um, then we will extend that and we will see that this simple thing that is called as stoichiometry which derives from uh, uh, from uh, mass balance really uh, from the concept that in a reaction uh, which is not of the nuclear type where there can be transmutation of elements and all that each element the number of atoms of each element should be conserved whether that element is part of a reactant or part of a product okay so that is the essential business of stoichiometry but there is more than meets the eye as far as the stoichiometry is concerned and this concept can be actually extended and it makes life easier for us also makes life uh, difficult for us uh, if you look, want to look at it that way but um, it helps us particularly in the analysis of complex reaction networks which can be very large for example if you look at reactions occurring in the climate there will be hundreds of reactions taking place or reactions taking place in the human body every cell there are thousands of reactions taking place right so these reactions form networks and a lot of the behavior of the reaction is due to the characteristics and topology of the network so these reaction networks can be simplified can be understood better if you follow the reaction network theory which is basically based in linear algebra okay so it derives from stoichiometry stoichiometric equations are linear and therefore linear algebraic uh, methods will apply to the analysis of stoichiometry so that is something that you will not have seen so we'll start with that and then um, uh, we will talk a little bit about thermodynamics and rate again by way of review and by way of a little extension right uh, now reaction thermodynamics you have done in your thermodynamics course Matlab equilibrium constant, Gibbs free energy, huh? these concepts are there. Okay, So, so that, those are the essential concepts there. And the reason why we talk about these stoichiometry, thermodynamics and rate before we go to further topics is that um, I like to think of reactions somewhat like I like to think of human beings. Right? Like, uh, human beings, you know, the, the way a person behaves is partly his nature, partly his or her nature, but uh, given that a person is a, has a certain kind of a nature, which may be partly genetics, partly environment, uh, partly his upbringing and so on, uh, you will not see the same kind of behavior in every setting. For example, yesterday we were discussing in a informal gathering, a certain professor in one of the IITs, 
which one of the senior colleagues who we were discussing with, he was a you know, very uh, jovial person, very um, uh, sympathetic to uh, students and so on and so forth. And there was in the gathering one person who had done his BTEC project with that person and he disagreed completely with uh, what was being said. So, so it is that you know you see different faces of a person depending on the context in which that person is operating. Okay, One may come across as a very jovial, very um, interactive kind of person in one setting, but in another setting he may be uh, when he is bossing and he wants to get something done. He may come across as a very kadus kind of uh, individual and uh, very difficult to deal with, very angry and so on, right? So reactions are also like that. They have their intrinsic nature and that intrinsic nature is encapsulated in these three aspects. The intrinsic nature of a chemical reaction is its stoichiometry, is the thermodynamic laws that it obeys and is the intrinsic kinetics that the reaction is born with. Right, But that said, the reaction does not behave according to the stoichiometry, thermodynamics and rate that you analyze in every setting. If you conduct it in, a, in an isothermal fashion, it will give you one kind of result. In a non-isothermal fashion, it gives, uh, gives you another kind of result. You conduct the reaction in a CSTR, it gives you one kind of result. In a plug flow reactor, you, these things you know. Okay, So the environment in which the reaction functions has an influence on what it delivers in terms of the amount of conversion it uh, delivers or in, in, in terms of the selectivity it, uh, it is able to give you and so on, right? But so oftentimes we try to exploit this and engineer an environment so that they, they, we get what we want from the reaction, although the reaction might intrinsically want to do something else, right? So and oftentimes, you know, the reaction is capable of a certain thing but the environment poses certain constraints on it so that it is not able to deliver its maximum. If you understand that, then you can engineer the reaction equipment much better so that you, you get more out of the uh, reaction system. And these days, there is a lot of emphasis on reducing wastage, you know, zero discharge and these kinds of concepts where uh, you try to, um, uh, you are interested in improving the atom selectivity of your reaction so that so every reaction converts as many molecules of the reactant to the desired product as possible. So increase selectivity and so on. So the better the job that you do at the reaction stage, the less is your work in the downstream processing side, where there are two problems. One is of course, there is the cost associated with separating complex reaction mixtures that come out of uh, complex product mixtures that come out of reactions. Uh, there is a cost associated with that, with it in achieving the required kind of purity. And uh, also, there is a problem of disposing of the waste, okay. So if you, if your reaction is not selective, then it produces things that you don't actually need and they have to be disposed of and there are, and you have to dispose it of in a responsible manner so that the environment is protected and so on, okay. That requires additional expenditure, additional equipment and so on, okay. So it's always better to do as good a job as possible uh, at the reaction stage itself so that all of these problems become less important, right? So, so the reason why I'm saying this is before we get to the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, reactor behavior and so on, we should try to understand what the reaction is intrinsically capable of. What is its real nature, okay? What is its intrinsic nature? And in order to do that, we talk about stoichiometry, thermodynamics and rate, right? Uh, now as far as this, uh, then there will be of course design for multiple reactions where we talk about uh, uh, conducting a reaction network in a reactor and looking at selectivity and uh, conversions and so on. And we will take up some case studies to illustrate these aspects. And in each, under each topic, at the beginning I have indicated the, uh, the books that I will follow. Okay, and what these books are, I will explain in a, in a minute. Uh, there is a book by Aris, um, which is kind of a classic. It's it's from the 1960s, uh, but it is still a, a very useful book to read. And I must have read read that book several times, and every time I read it, I understand the subject a little better. So uh, that is something I like to follow, especially as far as stoichiometry, thermodynamics, and rate is, rate is concerned. And there is a more recent book by uh, Marin and uh, uh, Yablonsky, 
uh, with more details uh, will follow. And these are the books on which the first topic will be based. And the second topic, having studied the, spent some time on isothermal reactions, then we will go to non-isothermal reaction engineering where, you know, as you know, uh, every reaction comes with uh, some kind of a heat effect usually, right? There are very few reactions whose heat effects are negligible, okay? Either reactions are exothermic or they are endothermic, right? Uh, there are, of course, a few reactions which are neither, but these are usually uh, not many in number. So, when reactions take place under non-isothermal conditions, so there are there are two ways of handling this non-isothermality arising out of uh, heat effects, that is uh, exothermicity and endothermicity. One is, in spite of the reaction either producing heat or uh, consuming heat, you might want to run it isothermally. Okay, in other words, you will attach a heat transfer system to it which will measure the temperature at every instant and do something to keep that temperature constant, right? So you, you will want to therefore compensate for the heat effects of the reaction. So that is one way of running it. And in which case the reactor design falls into the domain of isothermal reactions. But then you have to know something about the reaction heat effects in order to design the heat transfer system, okay, in order to make it run isothermally, right? There are situations in which it is actually more profitable to run a reaction under non-isothermal conditions. So we will see some of these situations, in which case you will want to exploit the non-isothermal uh, nature or the heat effects, the exothermicity or endothermicity of the reaction in order to make it deliver more in terms of a higher rate or a better selectivity or whatever, okay. So these aspects will concern us and these aspects will be analyzed on the basis of the reactor energy balance which you might have already been introduced to. Have you done the reactor energy balance? No. In chemical, huh? chemical processes we will do. In chemical processes you have done, okay, not in CL324. Huh? We will do. Chemical processes Oh, okay. Okay. So anyway, then we will uh, spend some time, time deriving the energy balance and then looking at its various applications and one of the applications will be reactor design for situations where isothermal operation is probably not the best uh, way to operate the reactor, okay. And then also what happens is that because of the, the thermal effects associated with the reaction, as I was mentioning some time back, there will be um, situations of multiple steady states and the stability of those steady states and weird kinds of behavior which are due to the nonlinear nature of the temperature dependence as well as, uh, you know, concentration dependence. We will study more about the temperature dependence in this case. So those things will form the subject matter of the second topic here. And for this, Vogler as a, as a good uh, treatment of this, Aris again is something that I will follow. And there is a book by Fromo and Bischoff. Uh, which also treats this topic rather well, right? And then we come to uh, non-ideal flow and reactor design. Here again, we start with a review because you already have an introduction to the basics of residence time distributions, the various, uh, uh, you know, the distribution functions, the E distribution and the F distribution and so on. Have you also done the I distribution, internal age distribution? Huh? No. Okay. So we will talk about that. And... Um, uh, so this was the residence time distribution theory was something that was developed by mainly by uh, a professor in uh, Cambridge uh, called uh, Dankwartz and uh, uh, so he developed this as a method of troubleshooting an existing reactor, okay. An existing reactor which was designed probably as a CSTR is not behaving like a CSTR, it is giving a conversion that is difficult, different from what was calculated. So what are the reasons for this? Non-ideal flow could be one reason. And therefore the theory uh, that he came up with uh, was meant to solve these kinds of situations. Okay, later on of course it has been developed in various ways. But then Dankwartz himself realized that uh, the residence time distribution is not the whole story. Okay, the basic, of, basic concept in residence time distribution is that a particle of fluid that enters the uh, reactor 
amount of conversion that happens in this given the reaction kinetics depends on how much time it spends in the reactor okay a very simple concept makes uh, you know it is common sense and in a situation like a CSTR there are particles which enter the reactor and immediately leave uh, because the whole thing is so well stirred that uh, you know and not not uh, every uh, particle of liquid will go through the same history right and then there are other particles which might get caught up in the stirrer, circulate in a, for a long time and then leave after a long time, okay. So the conversion that you see at the end is some kind of an average of conversion that happens in all these individual particles which have spent different extents of time in the reactor. So you talk about what fraction of the liquid has spent what length of time in the reactor and therefore what conversion it has achieved and then average it across the various uh, residence times that are possible in the reactor. So that is the basic theory of uh, residence times. But then Dankwartz himself realized that this is not the whole story because mixing is uh, adds another dimension to this because um, you know it not only matters as to how much time a particle of fluid has spent in the reactor, it also matters as to uh, well, how it has spent this time in the reactor, whether it has talked to the other, whether it has mixed with the other elements in the reactor or whether it has remained isolated. Uh, in a segregated sense and then achieve the conversion it has uh, achieved at the end, okay. The, this is the effect that goes under the name of micro mixing, right, different particles of fluid, how they interact, how they mix and so on. This can be rather complicated to analyze and there is no simple experimental method to like, uh, you know, e, dist e distribution, there are these tracer tests like impulse response and step response and so on. There is no equivalent uh, uh, measurement technique in order to analyze the micro mixing behavior of a reactor. Therefore, we talk about two extremes. If the micro mixing is perfect, what happens? If it is completely uh, imperfect, what happens? So that we can set limits on the conversion that a reactor will deliver based on these two extremes of behavior, okay. So there is a very nice analysis that a professor called Zwietering came up with in the Netherlands uh, in 1958. And that's still one of the monumental papers that people refer to and we will study that paper in some detail and that is this maximum mixedness and segregation. So this micro mixing is a term that you have, you have been exposed to in your CL324? No, okay. So we will do that. And again, as far as uh, uh, books are concerned, uh, Fogler, uh, Levenspiel, so this Levenspiel that I am talking about here is not the Levenspiel I was talking about you know, when, we, when we discuss this imbibit and falling into the reactor and dying and so on. So this is a different book, um, uh, I will, uh, it is called the reactor omnibook and uh, it pretty much covers the entire length and breadth of reaction engineering, right. So it is a good book to have, but I will give you more details as we go along. And then the final topic is uh, usually what happens is that by the time we come till here because of you know variations in treatment between S1 and S2 and so on and I have to cater to the common minimum level of knowledge that all of you have. Usually I am stressed for time by the time we get here, right. So depending on how much time we have left, so we will cover this topic in the amount of detail that the time allows, right. So under multiphase reactors, we talk about two different kinds of situations. There are, so multiphase means basically there are two phases, minimum of two phases. There may be more than two phases, minimum of two phases. And uh, not only are there minimum of two phases, but these, the uh, species that matter in the reaction, reactants, catalysts and so on, they are distributed across uh, multiple phases. So this, uh, this means that something has to be transferred from one phase to another before uh, it can undergo a reaction by meeting another reactant or by uh, by reacting with a catalyst, by interacting with a catalyst and so on, right. So there are, you know, the two broad ways in which we can study multiphase reactions and although the concepts are rather similar, historically these two have developed along two different lines and one is the situation in which the reaction is occurring in the dispersed phase. So the prototypical multiphase situation is uh, a situation in which one phase is dispersed in another. There is a continuous phase and what do we mean by a continuous phase? How do we? Hmm? 
No, continuous phase basically means that you can go from one point in the phase to another point in the same phase without crossing the other phase, right? So, supposing I have solid particles, let us say being, being fluidized by a stream of air or something like that and the whole bed is at that level, right? So, now when we say, supposing this is a liquid fluid as bed, okay? So, this will be a liquid in that case, not air. And so, there is the liquid and there are solid particles, let us say, okay? So, as far as the liquid is concerned, we can go from here to anywhere within the liquid without crossing any solid particle. So, we will call the liquid the continuous phase. But if you want to go from one solid particle to the other solid particle, you will have to go through the liquid phase, okay? So, that is the dispersed phase, right? So, so we have the prototypical situation is where you have one phase dispersed in the other, either as particles when it is a solid liquid or solid gas kind of a situation or as bubbles if it is a gas liquid kind of a system, right? So, in these situations, uh, there are one kind of condition is where the reaction occurs in the dispersed phase, okay? This is the situation that you have seen perhaps, okay? Catalyst pellets, okay? The reactants are sitting here, but the catalyst is sitting there. Therefore, the reaction has take, can only take place there, okay? And the reactants have to diffuse into the catalyst particle and, and react, okay? That is one situation. The other situation is where the reaction is in the continuous phase. Okay, so supposing these these are gas bubbles, and this is a liquid, and you are you are sending uh, you are like in a bubble column or a sparse reactor, right? So the the bubbles will contain one reactant. You know, if you consider an oxidation or a hydrogenation or something like that, so these are usually gases, the oxygen, hydrogen, etc., right? Or chlorine. So and uh, the the reactant with which this has to react the material to be oxidized, maybe a hydrocarbon, maybe something like cyclohexane, right, is in the liquid phase, right. So, then the oxygen has to diffuse into the liquid phase. Now, the reaction is in the continuous phase, okay. In both of these situations, the essential thing that you need to do is to account for the fact that there are concentration gradients, right. Not, not unlike in a homogeneous situation which is well stirred and all that like a batch reactor, not everything, not every point in the reactor is seeing the same concentration, right? If the reaction is in the, in a pellet like this, there is, the surface is at some concentration and as the material diffuses, you will get a concentration profile like this because the spherical symmetry, you know, it will be a symmetrical profile and so on. And therefore, every point here has a different concentration and therefore delivers a different rate, okay? The situation is much the same when the reaction is in the continuous phase and therefore, the concepts are kind of parallel, but uh, because of the historical way in which the subject matter has developed, there is a different kind of theory. So, this theory you are aware of, effectiveness factor and theta modulus and so on. There we, when the reaction is in the continuous phase, we talk about something called as Hatta number, which is very similar to Thiele modulus and its effect on the reaction uh, is encapsulated in terms of what is called as a, not an effectiveness factor, but an enhancement factor, okay? So, the, the difference in point of view arises because the reaction in continuous phase situation arises more in situations where, you know, for example, these days we talk a lot about carbon capture right because of concerns about uh, greenhouse gases and uh, the contribution of carbon dioxide to climate change and so on right now if you take a carbon capture that is absorbing carbon dioxide from a stream that contains carbon dioxide usually you employ a liquid in which the carbon dioxide dissolves this may be a physical dissolution or there may be something in the liquid that reacts with the carbon dioxide in order to capture that so the base case here is a, a mass transfer case the, the carbon dioxide transferring from the gas to the liquid, okay? The effect of the reaction is to speed up the mass transfer, okay? Therefore, we talk about an enhancement factor. Whereas, in this situation, 
The basic situation is you are employing a catalyst. The catalyst is to conduct a reaction. Therefore, the basic situation that you are interested in is a reaction, not mass transfer, right? And that reaction is slowed down by mass transfer, okay? So this is the difference in point of view. Here, there is a reaction that is taking place which is not able to occur at the maximum speed because of diffusion limitations. So there is a slowing down effect and therefore there is an effectiveness factor. In the other case, there is a speeding up effect of mass transfer by reaction and that is, uh, that is encapsulated in terms of a enhancement factor, okay? So these two types of theory have developed along different lines. And uh, so ideally I would like to cover both. And normally what I do is, uh, since effectiveness factor is something that you have already seen, I go directly to the other situation, the reactions in the continuous phase, where the enhancement factor theory will be developed, right? Uh, now depending on time this year, I would like to introduce a, a, a slightly different topic, um, which is this transient methods in catalysis. This is because of partly, partly because of personal reasons, we are we, are, uh, we have just acquired a very fancy piece of equipment which does the transient uh, analysis of uh, catalysts and gives you a lot of information which is otherwise not possible. In general, any steady state approach to determining kinetics or determining the characteristics of a reaction will give you only so much information and a transient method can in general give you much more information because there is also the, the time history that uh, accompanies the attainment of the steady state and that has a lot of information in itself and it makes for a more detailed characteristic uh, characterization of the reaction system, right, generally speaking. But then analyzing transient effects is not that easy because uh, when something is changing in time, now that change in time might be a result of several rate processes. For example, you know, if you want to measure the rate of uh, temperature rise, in a beaker that is being heated by an electric heater, for example, right? So there are several rate processes. It's not just what is going on within the beaker. So the heat has to pass from the heating element to the uh, vessel and it has to cross the vessel wall and then it has to get into the liquid and then inside the liquid there is either natural convection or forced convection. So all these rate processes have to uh, operate and if you have to uh, analyze the the heat transfer in the liquid itself, you have to decouple the observation, I mean the effects of the various other rate processes on the observation and then see what is the part of the observation that is only due to the heat transfer in the liquid, okay? So therefore, in general, there is more work that is needed in analyzing transient kinetics, but there is a certain methodology that has been developed over the last uh, 30, 40 years since the 1980s or so, and that is called as the temporal analysis of products. It's a transient method to analyze catalysts in, in fine detail, and now we have an equipment with which we can do this. And therefore, you know, I would like to introduce you to that topic. So, I will start with the reaction in the dispersed phase, which is a little different to what I have done in the previous editions of the course, where I have usually started with the reaction in the continuous phase. So, we'll start with, the, I mean, a brief review of the effectiveness factor theory modulus concepts, and then get into the transient analysis, and introduce the TAP methodology, its analysis, and what is its features, and so on. Uh, so, that is essentially the course and um, in terms of texts, the text that I have referred to in the preceding section, Fogler you are already familiar with, so that's the textbook you would have followed, right? So I have I have uh, indicated fourth edition, you might have followed the subsequent edition I think, so an, a later edition, uh, that doesn't matter. So Fogler we will still use, but uh, we will use a number of other books as well. Uh, ARIS I mentioned, uh, Elementary Chemical Reactor Analysis. This is, uh, a, there is a preceding uh, edition of this which is called as Introduction to Chemical Reactor Analysis or something like that. Uh, that is in some sense more detailed and uh, ARIS has 
kind of uh, made the subject matter a little simpler in the second edition. So this is a book that is not easily available, but I will uh, I have a, a e copy which I will uh, place on the course interface for you to read. The book by Levenspiel that I refer to is called Chemical Reactor Omnibook. I'll bring it to the class sometime and show you. And it's a it's a fat book, and which covers pretty much everything there is in chemical reaction engineering. Right? Then there is a there is a graduate level textbook by Fromo and Bischoff called Chemical Reactor Analysis and Design. We will refer to it from time to time, but not on a continuous basis. If we get into gas liquid reactions, that is reactions in the continuous phase in great detail, then the books to follow are these two. The book by Dankwartz, uh, the same Dankwartz who did all this mischief about uh, resonance time theory, he also did other kinds of work in gas liquid reactions. So that is a book to follow or uh, a book by Swami and Sharma, uh, Heterogeneous Reactions. Heterogeneous Reactions Volume 1 is about gas solid reactions or fluid solid reactions. Volume 2 is about gas liquid reactions or fluid, li fluid uh, I mean, yeah, gas liquid reactions. So these, of course, we will need to use them if we get to uh, gas liquid reactions in any great detail. Okay. So, something that uh, by now you will be saying, you know, get to the crux of the matter. What about assessment and so on, right? So, that is the next thing, right? So, this class participation, you know, these pop up quizzes that, you know, we have almost in every lecture, two to five questions in every lecture. So, they will contribute about five marks in the uh, end. And uh, tutorial sessions, this, the material that you submit at the end of tutorial hour, that they will account for 10 percent. Assignments, 15 percent. Quizzes, 8. So these will be almost all surprise quizzes. The course project, 12 percent. And therefore, because there are so many elements in the evaluation, the weightage for the exams is a little less than in a conventional course. So the end sum exam is worth 30 marks and mid sum exam is worth 20 marks, 20 percent. And uh, so these will also be shorter than the usual uh, because the weightage is less. Uh, the end sum exam may be two hours instead of three hours. So that I'll announce it the, as the time goes by. Okay.